Good afternoon. Um, I don't think it's probably morning anywhere else um, <laughs> where we are, but possibly. Um, but good day to everybody. And thank you so much for coming to our event today. Uh, we are very excited. Uh, my name is Christina Clayton. I'm one of the co-directors of the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. Uh, welcome to today's webinar of integration of the N-Class in health services delivery with Suganya and Scott. We will do more introductions in a moment, but they're from Change Matrix. Um, and also Region 9 MHTTC is how I know Saganya. So it's very, very, very humbly grateful that you are here to do uh, this webinar today. Um, Want to just share our land acknowledgement. We are based in Seattle um, in our center. And so the University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Squamish and Tulalip and Muckleshoot nations. Um, if you don't know uh, the stewards of your land, you can click nativeland.ca and we'll put that in the chat. Um, and we'll get through some logistics, but thank you so much for joining us. A little bit about the network. Um, thank you for doing this poll. I forgot we should probably st stop and just look at that. Um, should we share the results before we get into our introductions? They are being shared. They're right being now. shared. Perfect. Okay. So great to see who is here. And wow, I think that's a record for how many um, roles are other. Um, so thank you for putting that in the chat and also for settings. So always just great to know who's in the audience today. Um, so if you haven't heard of us, um, sometimes we do that poll. Have you been to an MHTTC event before? Um, but if you haven't, um, we are a nationwide network that's supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, otherwise known as SAMHSA. Our network includes 10 regional centers. A, Native, uh, a National American Indian Alaska Native Center, a National Hispanic and Latino Center, and a network coordinating office. Um, and there are also networks for the uh, prevention and uh, addiction fields as well using the same structure. So we support resource development, dissemination of best practices, workforce development. Um, and for us, we are in uh, you know, the Northwest region. And so here we are, and we uh, have the pleasure of working with Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Of course, in this virtual world, we work with people from all over the place. So we are excited to uh, see you and have you uh, where, from wherever you are. A little bit about our Northwest MHTTC. So our goals as a center are the same as the network is to adopt you know, evidence-based practices, heighten knowledge and skills, foster alliances, and provide free training like today. And how we do that are, you know, live webinars, we have learning communities, we have communities of practice, we have online courses you can take, everything we do is free. Um, and so even though our area of focus for the network is evidence-based practices for serious mental health issues, such as psychosis, we train on a lot of things. So school, mental health, integrated care, suicide prevention, diversity and equity issues, trauma-informed approaches, peer support, et cetera. And really anyone, um, I think most people's work touches the mental health uh, field these days, um, and especially uh, it's a wide range of people that can come to our training. So anyone is welcome. And we do do a newsletter and uh, announcements for events. So if you um, aren't signed up for our newsletter, um, you can do that and we'll share how to do that later. Really great to see some of the various roles that are here. So appreciate everybody's coming. Just some housekeeping, um, you're muted, you're off camera, it's a webinar. So, but we will share recordings and slides and send instructions on how to get a certificate of attendance in a few weeks. If you, uh, while you're here, uh, just note that we both have chat and Q&A. And so what we'd like to do for the presenter's um, ability to sort of answer questions as we go along, chat is really great for just checking in, saying where you're from. If there's something that is prompted for you to do in the chat, that's great. If you have a content question for the speakers, please put it in the Q&A box. And so um, after each section, I will be letting uh, Saganya and Scott know if there are any questions queued up at that point, and they will try to answer what they can as they go along after each section. If you put it in the chat, I can't copy and paste it. I don't know why, um, but I will ask you, or Gabrielle will ask you, who's looming in the background with our team, um, to put it in the QA box and we'll go from there. Lastly, um, so obviously SAMHSA funds us to do this work. They don't have specific knowledge about this exact event. Um, so there's a little kind of disclaimer there. 
Um, another thing is we do have the requirement of a very, very short survey, and we are very, very grateful for your feedback. We look at all of the feedback. It's aggregated for us. We don't see individual responses. Um, so if you could take the time at the end of the session, it takes literally two minutes to do. And we really, really do appreciate, you know, if you liked this, it helps keep the free training coming. Um, and we we really want to, um, you know, know how, how it was received. I will note that when you get the evaluation link this time, if you have done one of these GIPRA surveys before, it always asked for a personal code and it was like four digits. You made up some, you know, digit, you know, numbers and letters based on your, your personal information. They have changed these forms. And I just want to let everyone know that it's, it's worse now. Um, and I don't mean to uh, lay too much blame, but the personal code has changed to now 12 digits. And it's much different. It might feel even more invasive or personal than before. I just want to let you know, you can put whatever letters and numbers you want. This is a one-time event and you just put whatever you're comfortable with. Cause we want you to feel comfortable when, and we want your feedback. So whatever you can do, uh, we appreciate it. We'll also email you the link, but if it looks different than before, there's a reason. Thank you. So today's presenters, we are so grateful to have Saganya Sakalingam one of the founding partners uh, and change specialists at Change Matrix, um, a small minority and women owned business focusing on motivating, managing and measuring systems change. She supports individuals, organizations and systems addressing equity, including diversity, inclusion, implicit bias, structural racism, cultural competence and cross-cultural communications. Dr. Sakalingam also provides leadership development and provides technical assistance via the Pacific Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, otherwise known as Region 9 in our network, and the TA Resource Center. And again, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Saganya for the past three and a half years, I suppose, however long we've been going um, with uh, our Building Health Equity and Culturally Responsiveness work group at the network. She leads all sorts of things for our network, which is fantastic, as well as her colleagues. Um, Scott Van Lu serves as Change Matrix Project Director and Change Consultant. He is the founder and president of Cedar Tree Consulting an organization that provides transformational learning experiences focusing on equity, change, and leadership. He has almost 30 years experience, including equity and diversity training, has been a facilitator with the National Coalition for Equity in Education, respecting Ethnic and Cultural Heritage Center. Excuse me, I have braces that are a little bit new, so I apologize. I'm still getting used to speaking with them. Um, and the Anti-Defamation uh, League. Scott is passionate about creating safe spaces for equitable dialogue and transformational experiences that promote and challenge individuals' thinking and professional growth. So thank you, Scott. Thank you, Saganya, for being here. Um, couldn't think of better folks to, to really be here today. So um, do you want to say a quick hi before we uh, get to our conversation? Thank you so much, Christina. Hello, everyone. Uh, it really is our pleasure to be uh, with you today. And we're looking forward to uh, our conversation with you. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm talking to you from uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, home of, of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Sioux, and Ute. And I'm also very uh, glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be in your company. Thank you so much. So I wanted to have this conversation with you, Saganya and Scott, uh, you know, as we're talking about the importance of the N class standards or the national culturally and linguistically appropriate services standards. And I don't know about everyone, we might've done a poll, um, you know, to think about this, you know, curious, you know, for folks, how many are very familiar with these standards, how many use them regularly, really understand how these standards impact their work. We know that the goals are to advance health equity and eliminate disparities, but how does that look in practice for people? So my first question to you both um, is you both have a lot of experience and passion for training on these topics and are obviously very effective. It's something that everybody really needs. How did you come to focus on culture and equity specifically in your work? Um, I guess I can, I can start. Um, when I was 13, my country went through a civil war and overnight uh, 
many of us from different population group, uh, from two other population groups, uh, became second class citizens. And so we lost opportunities for higher education, lost opportunities for good jobs, uh, for a good living, and uh, really to, to have a meaningful life. And I think that was the, the uh, um, impetus for me, at least, to think about social justice and to think about equity. And um, so I would say it started uh, through personal experience. I would agree. I, I have a similar um, experience in the regard of, of growing up in a multicultural household. My mother's family is Lebanese and Lebanese American. My, my father's family Dutch. Uh, so my own personal experience of, of um, finding my own identity is, is very germane to the work that I do, as well as um, early experiences working with youth, uh, my early career as a public school special education teacher uh, led me to many key questions around equity. I was always questioning why the disparities, why were certain groups performing at a different level than other groups? And um, that, that those early questions really shaped my exploration. Thank you for that. I mean, I think it's, it's clear, it's such a need, it has been a need, it often comes from personal experience. And I know that when we've talked with other folks, you know, it is a lot of what drives all of us to do our various aspects of work, not just a career choice that seemed good in a catalog, right? You know, that these are very personal things sometimes. Um, was there a moment in your career or your work experience or something that you know, when you first heard of the class standards, when you first thought about the need or how these things have become so important, because um, they have been around for a while, and yet I'm not sure if they're really integrated daily for people who are delivering, you know, you know, mental health services, behavioral health services, general health services, education services, as you mentioned, Scott. So, you know, is there a moment in your career that you thought, Oh wow, this is really obvious. You started to, I think, hint at that, Scott, a little bit. Why were some groups performing certain ways or being analyzed in certain ways? So, anything that sticks out in your careers that that underscored the need for these? I can start with this one. Yeah, um, again, for me, it's my education background, public education. Um, seeing many, many languages in our schools. Uh, some, some schools in our Denver area, I'm sure in your metropolitan areas as well, there are upwards of 20 plus different languages spoken in any one school. Um, and, you know, we're talking about just basic rights uh, with the class standards. We're talking about access and um, creating at least the conditions uh, for, for folks to be successful in whatever area. And also to help uh, co-create their their own idea of what they want or need within those different containers, whether it's school or uh, health or, or otherwise. Um, really quickly, a, a, an experience for me that kind of brought the two worlds together. I had a student, I was teaching in a bilingual uh, school, dual language school, and had a student from El Salvador who uh, uh, got very ill and had to be rushed from the hospital in the mountains of Colorado down to Metro Denver. Uh, her mother was unable to go with her because of uh, financial reason and needed to work the next day and was caretaking for other kids. So this was probably a seven-year-old uh, young, young woman, uh, student, and she had to take this ambulance ride by herself. There were no bilingual people in the ambulance. She had to check into this children's hospital by herself. Um, and her mother was unable to see her for, I think it was four or five days. So my wife and I decided to go visit, I think on day two. And when we found her, um, she was in this play area, but there were, there were no books in Spanish. There were no, nothing accessible. I mean, nothing. And this, uh, this was only two years ago. So again, really well-meaning services, well-meaning people. But um, for this particular instance, uh, we missed the mark, right? We really missed the mark. Thank you. Well, I, for me, I think it, it uh, the, the focus on the class standards uh, began 
when I was the director of multicultural health for the Oregon Health Division. Um, it, had, it, it was in the late 80s that we began talking about the importance of culture uh, at, in terms of how we access services, in terms of how we utilize services, in terms of how services are provided. And it really started with folks, uh, social, uh, social well, welfare workers uh, who serve children who recognized that none of our services were meaningful to the children who came from different cultures. And so I think that then the work around wanting to provide culturally appropriate services became very, very apparent. So the Office of Minority Health decided that they needed to identify what, what needed to be done, and they developed a series of standards. Um, and they, we, we actually used those standards in those first 10 years or so, but there was a lot of uh, confusion about some of those standards. And so they actually came back and they enhanced the, the standards and, and we have now the, the existing standards. And the purpose behind all those standards is to really ensure that we are providing services that are culturally resonant, culturally appropriate, um, and really meet the needs of uh, the people we serve. Thank you. Um, this isn't really my time for storytelling, but I did <laughs> think of, a, of an experience as you were sharing. I worked in um, an HIV AIDS kind of behavioral health, you know, housing place uh, many, many moons ago. And we had a, a person from Honduras and he did not speak any English. I was very new as a junior baby social worker. Absolutely. Um, and none of our staff spoke Spanish. Um, and I don't think this is necessarily in line with the, the class standards necessarily. Obviously, we had interpretation uh, for all of these medical appointments and, you know, things like that, um, trying to communicate with family when there was, you know, the ability to do so. Um, but a small thing that I did <laughs> was you know, I think it was just at least a gesture, um, as you're mentioning, Scott, no books, no toys, no, you know, anything that sort of come from, from that, that girl's culture. Um, he, he, somehow I had something on television that I could tape and it was like a variety show that was in Spanish. And I just remember, cause that was still the days of VCRs, if you can remember. Um, and so I would videotape these shows that he asked from the Spanish language channel. And it just gave him something that he looked forward to so much because there was nothing on our, you know, it's, it's a little thing. Um, but it just struck me as you were telling your stories, this is not the most, you know, desperate kind of situation, but just even having, any kind of entertainment when you're really, you're stuck in a place, you don't have anyone to talk to. You have like, we also hired someone just to have conversations that he could chat with, you know, um, in Spanish, because that was so uh, dire of a need, but um, it was really, uh, you know, it's just these little things, but um, that was just one of my early career moments that I was thinking about that you're, you're speaking. So what inspires you now? I mean, this is personal, this is professional. Um, how can people, what inspires you to keep teaching people to put this together, to have these ideas in mind, you know, in having a practice that strives for equity, um, you know, obviously learning what the class standards are, if people don't know, not just having them in a grant application and not really understanding what that means. That's sort of also been my experience at times. Um, so what inspires you to keep doing this work, even though I know it's so, there's so much more work to do. Um, I think of health as a basic right and, um, and, and for people to be able to access services, to be able to utilize services that really meets their need um, is, is important. And, and, and that's what inspires me to do this work. I, I keep telling people I've been doing this work for a very, very long time. And it first started off as providing cross-cultural health then it went to providing culturally competent help. And then we included, you know, uh, culturally, uh, uh, sort of cultural humility to it. And then we started talking about DEI work in the last eight years or so. And now we talk about doing, um, you know, anti-racism work because we know that um, our systems um, have been built on sort of colonial structures and, and so, we need to really think about do those those uh, structures service now, 
uh, where we are today and do they serve us in, a, a, in an equitable way? And I think that those questions are, are the ones that really uh, keep me uh, thinking about it and keep, keeps me focused on this work. Uh, for me, what, what keeps me motivated, especially in the mental health field, is um, the universality of, of, of the need. I mean, there is not a community, there is not a, uh, a culture that's not affected by mental health needs within their community and within our community. And for me, uh, my personal belief is, is that we're all connected and we, um, to solve these very complex issues, um, many of which have been created through years and years and years of, of othering or years and years and years of, of system type uh, inequalities. We have to approach them with very complex answers and solutions and very creative answers and solutions. Um, and some of these pieces are, are just, again, to me, our basic access issues for connecting our common humanity. And yet there's a need to go beyond that to really um, heal. Like we have really, uh, we have a lot of pain, a lot of hurt in our communities and we all need to take ownership for that. It, it, we, we have to move beyond this is your problem or this is this community and, or this happened to this person who is this color. Like it, it's happening to all of us all the time and we have to take ownership of it. Well, thank you so much. I know we could talk all day, um, but it's it's so inspiring to hear your stories, your perspective. Um, certainly, we'll make sure that resources are available um, because I know there's a lot to the class standards. There are other ways to, you know, there's a lot of materials out there that we'll make sure people have, have access mm -hmm. to because um, there's a, a lot of things um, to help put this into action. Um, but thank you so much for talking today. I uh, really appreciate talking about this important topic. Um, so yeah, thank you. So at this point, uh, we'll let you uh, take over the screen, so to speak, and let you get to your main presentation. And uh, thanks so much for chatting with me. Thank you so much, Christina, and thank you for this opportunity. So I am going to share my screen and uh, let me just start the presentation. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, I'm going to share something just a little similar to what uh, Christina shared. And we are Region 9. We're the Pacific Southwest region. And so that is uh, California. Um, Hawaii, uh, Nevada, which is where I'm from, and Arizona. And then it's the six Pacific region uh, islands, Guam, uh, the um, Republic of Palau, Marshall Islands, American Samoa, and, uh, my, and the uh, Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. And so uh, we provide this, this series of service in a variety of different ways to uh, our constituents uh, in this region. We offer our services in, in, as a tiered process. There is this universal products and resources that we have, that we create, and it, we combine that in, in one central location with the resources and products from all the regions, uh, regional centers. And so there is a huge uh, directory uh, and a library of resources that I hope that you all will take a few minutes to go and explore and then go back to it as you need resources and as you need materials. We also offer monthly office hours when we take on a, a specific topic and we uh, walk through uh, the, the, that topic and uh, answer uh, questions that people might have. And then the third step is the intensive TA. Uh, it might be, uh, uh, sort of to for an individual state or for an individual entity, and we will do an exploratory call with them and then identify the scope of the TA and then be able to provide that for them. And as always, we provide webinars and trainings and sort of a, a variety of uh, different uh, tools so that people can access uh, and learn uh, in a variety of different ways. So, so that, that's the work we do. 
And one of the things that we have done as all the regional centers coming together is we really recognized that we want to use language that is affirming, respectful, and that it's re uh, recovery uh, oriented. We want to ensure that our uh, language is strength-based and hopeful, that we're communicating in a way that it's inclusive and accepting of diverse cultures, genders, perspectives, our focus is always healing centered and trauma responsive. And we do invite individuals to participate in their own journeys. And so today we welcome your feedback and your responses via chat uh, as we explore a variety of different issues. We, we always focus on providing person first and free of labels, which I think sometimes is problematic because we are a, a fast moving uh, paced world and we try to we use jargon and we use acronyms because we want to move along fast. But I think this is where we really need to stop and think about uh, what it is that we're doing and, and the respect we need to be able to provide, uh, to, uh, provide people. Uh, we focus on non-judgmental uh, a sort of way of communicating and avoiding assumptions. We, we are respectful, clear, and understandable. And we're always consistent with our actions, policies, and products. So across the board, whatever the MHTCs TTCs do, we are really focusing on how we communicate and, um, and, and ensure that uh, people feel uh, included and they feel like they belong. And so with, with try to model that today. And uh, what we are going to do is uh, we're going to talk about the basic concepts and facts about the, the national class standards. Uh, and then we're going to be uh, uh, deciding how to how does that work in healthcare settings. Now I know some of you might come from school mental health settings. I didn't I didn't quick I need to go back and check how many of you are from that uh, sent, uh, setting. But we have also provided uh, sort of standards. We adapted the standards for school mental health, and we I sh will sh share that with you. And thirdly, we want to describe the uh, standards and how they will be adapted to advance health equity and eliminate disparities within healthcare settings. So we're going to be sharing with you some implementation strategies that you can use as well. Now, as I said before, um, as a society, we've sort of moved along in our understanding of what it means to provide services that are meaningful. Uh, initially, we recognized uh, multicultural uh, communities, and so we thought of providing cross-cultural care. And then we recognize the need for our, our services to truly be uh, measurable and, monitor, uh, and, and to be monitored. And so we started talking about competencies and we then recognize the need for us to be culturally humble because there's so much that we don't know and that we need to depend on our, uh, on our, our constituents, our families, our clients to tell us um, their, which is their, through their lived experiences, what is critical to them and important to them. We then began to take a step back and take a look at it in a more systemic way and started looking at diversity and uh, uh, inclusion and belonging. And I think ultimately we are at a place now where we are finally naming the 400 pound gorilla that has always been in our rooms when we've been planning and implementing. And that is the systemic racism that, uh, that exists in our organizations. Uh, they've been there for a very long time. It is not like they were newly created and we've never questioned them in some ways. And so we're beginning to question them. So that these class standards are going to then, uh, if we in introduce them, if, if we integrate them into our services, they're going to chip away at some of those, uh, you know, long held beliefs and practices uh, that really create disparities and inequity in, in our services. And so in order for us to understand that, we, we also have to understand what it means, what do we mean by that we want to have ensure equitable services. And so I like to use this particular, uh, particular visual, which many of you might have. So I guess my question to you is, have any of you seen this? And if you have, how many of, uh, in what way was it shared with you? Uh, what was the conversation uh, behind the visual being shared with you? So, 
So Gunny, are you asking yes. folks to do that in the chat? In the chat, yeah. In the chat, I'm yes. Excellent. I'm sorry, Perfect. I should have been more precise. No, yes. no, no worries. <laughs> uh, Katie has seen the, the visual before in equity presentations. Okay, okay. Ah, Joseph says this is more powerful. Yes, there are multiple versions of this, so I understand. Ah, Alistair uses this visual, okay. It further explains the difference between equity and equality. Yes. Excellent. So this is not new to many of you. And as you clearly pointed out, it really uh, uh, indicates the differences between equality and equity. And yes, uh, in initially, I think there were just like uh, equality, equity, and uh, uh, and now with this uh, uh, social justice and reality. And so I think what we are recognizing is that um, we really want to get to social justice, where uh, healthcare is available to all where healthcare uh, provides services in the most meaningful way to people, which means that it recognizes their cultural values and beliefs and practices around uh, health, receiving health, that our systems of services are uh, devoid of uh, systemic uh, racial, racist, racialized practices. And so that is what we're aiming for, that uh, uh, social justice. Currently, I think where we are in some in some instances uh, in the three things uh, before that, uh, in many places, the reality is that people have very poor, very inadequate services. And in other instances, well-meaning organization and well-meaning people say, we're going to treat everyone equally. So, you know, our services are from uh, nine to five, you know, um, you know, during the day, uh, our staff can come in and work. And so um, it'll be equal to, our, uh, e you know, equal in terms of how we treat our staff and how we treat our clients. Like not recognizing that it might mean that people have to take time off from work to come in for services, which means that they might lose uh, hours of pay. And so, you know, equality is a concept that sounds good except when you put it into practice and then it makes it, uh, you know, you then begin to recognize systemically how we are creating inequity. And, uh, and then the equity is that trying to give people what they need so they can uh, actually achieve the services. And ultimately, I think it is a, a recognition that we have to do so much more. We have to take away that fence uh, we have to dismantle those kinds of uh, racialized practices and racialized infrastructure and policies uh, that really truly uh, prevents uh, equity from occurring. And so as you think about the class standards and as we share the class standards, keep that in mind uh, of how can we create uh, uh, practices, how do we create uh, initiatives that can truly allow for uh, a, a, a sort of a much more just way of providing services. There are wonderful uh, comments here. Um, let me see, it says, the one thing that is consistent has been the relatedness, diverse groups in terms of fixed reality and experience and inequity in resources and opportunities and privilege. Yes, yes, uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Yes, um, you know, I think if we explore this in greater detail, uh, if it was truly social justice, they would be sitting in the ballpark uh, that they, they could afford to be a part of the audience just like everyone is in that audience and not stand apart. And so agreed. Uh, there's been, you know, th there are some folks who say, wait a minute, everybody is the same color. Some folks would say, you know, uh, that, that, that there are things that probably uh, could be improved on, but it's a great active uh, uh, a tool to use. And we can also ask people in what ways can you improve this further? And I think that that can be a great conversation. So it is on this basis of understanding where we wanna go that we are going to then look at, our, at the class standards. 
So it is based on our Civil Rights Act of 1964 that says that no person in the United States shall on the ground of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participation and be denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. It is this, this is the clause that really informs the work that the Office of Minority Health did uh, around the class standards. What they, what they did was that because of an executive order that really looked at meaningful access for people who had uh, limited English capacity, uh, they created the class standards. And at that time, there were 14 standards and they weren't um, you know, classified the way they currently are. And, and many other things went to support the, the existence of the class standards, uh, such as uh, the Joint Commission uh, actually uh, integrating the standards into their quality assurance. Uh, then in 2010, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act talked about providing services that are appropriate uh, for, for their clientele. And then in 2012, we had the Healthcare Education and Reconciliation Act that really looked at uh, you know, where we provide health services, both in the health sector and the education sector, and how we needed to ensure that those services were appropriate. And then in 2013, uh, what, we, what we did is a lot of people came together and we said that we needed to make the standards. The initial standards were very broad in scope. And if you took a particular standard, it was very hard to then uh, identify what exactly we could do uh, within that standard. And so in the, in the process of creating the enhanced class standard, they really took each standard and said, how can we be, we be as specific as possible? And, and I think that that's the work we did uh, to, uh, to actually look at it and identify the different ways in which we can ensure that each of these uh, standards could be put into practice. So um, Scott is now going to talk to us a little bit more about um, the, the, the background behind uh, the class standards. Thank you so much, Saganya. And uh, if you would, please, in the chat space, think about this idea of culture and what are aspects or um, components of culture that you could identify. Just quickly, first thought, best thought, either a word or a phrase in the chat space. What is culture? What are aspects of culture? Great spirituality, clothing, traditions, holidays, values, language, music, food. Mm, old ways of teaching. That's interesting. Too. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Great uniqueness. Social norms, I saw an interesting one there. Let's see, the fence is a major barrier. Okay, great, parenting styles. Yes, keep those coming and we can move on to Danya. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I wanted to share this uh, definition of culture. This is actually credited to Saganya in 2009. I believe she was uh, looking at other sources and did not find one that really fit what she was sensing or feeling at that time. Uh, so the def definition she used is culture at its most basic definition is a powerful social system based on a group's values, norms, and expectations. It is a communication and interaction guide for a group's way of thinking, feeling, and acting. Culture informs how a group perceives health wellness, disease, healthcare, and prevention. Next slide. So uh, you might have seen this also, this uh, theory of culture as an iceberg has been around since the mid seventies um, and credited, I believe, to someone named Edward T. Hall. And uh, we added this other visual because as Saganya mentioned, we work with many of the Pacific Island nations um, and they had never seen an iceberg <laughs> and they, lo and behold, don't, you know, it's not prevalent in their system of schooling, et cetera. So, 
uh, we also included this island, right? Same, same kind of um, idea for context that there's uh, some, some kind of access above a surface and some kind of access below a surface. And oftentimes uh, what's below the surface is very vibrant, um, deep, et cetera. There's only a, a small percentage of an iceberg that's above the water, for example. Um, and same with the island. And we can go to the next slide. So uh, the theory that, that Hall was uh, sharing talks about uh, observable behaviors above this idea of, of the water um, and non-observable or the deeper elements of culture below the surface. And I like to also think of what's above the water uh, as things that are accessible through our five senses, right? And if you think back or, or think back to what you just wrote and put in the chat about those aspects of culture, and which ones did you go to first? Did you put the observable ones in or did some of you, I think, started to mention and, and get in touch with some of the deeper elements or non-observable components of culture? And then the air and the water could be even considered or thought of as external factors. So there's all these things that are pushing on um, our observable or non-observable aspects of culture all the time. So there's constant dynamic um, it's shifting, it's changing based on external factors, which can include, uh, you know, politics and um, even intermarrying in, in different generations, et cetera, et cetera. Thoughts about like in my own family, I'm uh, second generation on Lebanese on my mother's side. And each generation we've lost languages. Like it's, it's just been determined at some level, uh, this is not important to teach. So we will only do this or that. And then at this point in our family reunions, um, you'd think there was a group of 100 strangers coming together, right? Because there's so much intermarrying. There's so many different factions of belief systems and um, religion and et cetera, et cetera. So um, even though we all belong to the same culture, family culture, uh, there are many, many different non-observable aspects to even our existence. Um, and then those things that are non-observable, that are constantly changing uh, and dynamic, <laughs> Torrance, we still do too. Thank you. We still have family reunions. Uh, I hope those never go away. But yeah, when it gets to like third and fourth cousins, you're kind of like, okay, who are you? What are you doing? Um, but you know, some of the some of the external factors um, and, and internal factors are things like nationality, language, um, even uh, things like uh, accents. Right? It's it's any of these factors that influence the way in which we interact uh, with our environment or with our world or how others perceive us is also very important. And we can move on to the next slide. So we added this one because it's, it's really important. These are just some, some quick touch points that are very important, but cultural membership can be chosen or imposed on, a, on an individual, right? So there are things that we're automatically put into based on assumptions and biases and different pieces that we don't, we won't go into in depth today, but we could at another time, right? This whole idea of implicit bias um, or implicit association, how just by using those five senses, we make immediate decisions about other people and we put them into cultural categories or cultural membership. And then there's those things that have a lot of meaning to us that we choose to be a part of. The second one is really important too. Culture is something that everyone and all organizations have, right? Let that one sit in for a minute. Everyone has it. And all organizations have a culture, whether it's apparent or not, walking into any organization, any building, any business, any nonprofit, and it, it has a culture, right? And so it's worthwhile to determine what are, what are we putting out there? What are we... Uh, communicating either verbally, non-verbally, et cetera, uh, to others. And then finally, we must be able to move beyond our limitations or our understanding of our culture uh, to get to that place of, of depth. So um, are we moving on? We're moving on to this. Oh, sorry. I, I didn't realize it changed <laughs> when I, I was looking for something to uh 
here you go. Yeah. Okay, we could move on. Beyond My this. apologies. That's okay. Okay. Um, so why does this matter? You know, why are we talking about culture within this context? I think hopefully we've moved um, beyond that, but we do want to at least talk about this very fundamental aspect in healthcare systems um, that the, the disparities still exist, right? And we don't, I mean, I'm, we don't, we're not going to go into a history of that today, but we don't have to look any farther than the whole COVID uh, situation to, to know and how long it took for us to identify those disparities, right? In many communities, the COVID crisis was a cultural crisis. It affected certain groups far more than other groups, right? Or uh, if any of you are familiar with um, Serena Williams, the tennis player, and she very openly shared how she had to take control of her own healthcare after her, the birth of her uh, child, that she, she was having embolisms uh, she had done research on it as a, as a female, a black female, and um, she had to convince the nurse to get the doctor to address it. Uh, so even though she's wealthy and very recognizable, still as, a, as an African-American woman in this situation, in the healthcare situation, she still found herself having to advocate for her own care and need, right? And on and on and on. There's so many stories, research, et cetera, that we can point to. Um, including all these, these talk, talking points, higher mortality rates, um, obvious differences, unequal treatment, um, which again is, can either be de facto or it can be, um, it can either, it can be uh, not necessarily um, on purpose, right? Like we're not setting out to be, uh, have, a, have an unequal treatment, but the, the result we talk about um, impact and effect, right? Intention and or effect. So there's also this, um, I think, a fairly recent wave of acknowledging and integrating. We hear about integrated medicine or integrated centers across the United States, where we're, we're looking at and valuing what people can bring. This idea of co-creating our healing by acknowledging and valuing what people bring from their culture to uh, to their own service. Yes. So this, um, I wanted to bring in very quickly again, this, this comes from the Othering and Belonging Institute at the University of California, Berkeley, which is headed up by Dr. John A. Powell. Uh, and he, um, they define belonging as the space of moving beyond even DEI, right? Moving beyond uh, acceptance tolerating, accommodating. So belonging means having a meaningful voice and the opportunity to participate in the design of political, social, and cultural structures that shape one's life. The right to both contribute and make demands upon the society, institutions, etc. At its core, structural belonging holds a radically inclusive vision, radically inclusive, because it requires mutual power, access, and opportunity among all groups and individuals within a shared container. I love that the visual painting there, shared container. So containers such as our schools, our mental health services, our hospitals, et cetera, that you can actually co-create uh, your experience, that we value it that much, that we're willing uh, to create a space for that to happen. Okay, so why implement class? Again, there's many, many challenges that have been longstanding and still exist today This uh, around systemic or institutionalized isms, biases, um, the lack of cultural competency on healthcare providers, right? Or what we might call um, culturally responsive skills the ability to diagnose uh, can even be a privilege, right? Using the medical model can be a privilege because we have something we can hold over someone else, so whether it's knowledge or it's information or it's access. Um, and then there's been centuries of this going on uh, for a long time. So it's ingrained within our systems. Now these two are on the same slide because they go hand in hand, this idea of community care and culturally based practices. 
Um, and again, I mentioned places like uh, the Andrew Veal Integrated Medical Center in, in Arizona, um, others in California and Minnesota uh, are starting to acknowledge and value and welcome and bring in some of these other approaches. And we're even getting away from calling them alternate or alternative healthcare, or Eastern or Western, or getting rid of some of this language, right? We're just calling it integrative medicine. And we're actually acknowledging the existence and the, the benefit of it. So um, just take a look for yourself at these examples of the community care and the examples of culturally based practices and things again, which the medical model has, has traditionally completely discounted because it can't quote unquote be proven or, or hadn't um, been doing that. But we're, we're, we're starting to merge the two. We're starting to merge the science and the research with traditional practices and cultural based practices. Okay. So again, in the chat, if you would, what are, what are some strengths, solutions, resiliencies, and alternate strategies or strategies of your communities? I'd even say cultural strategies of your communities. What are some that you know about um, that could be integrated or that you could learn more about yourself? The church, thank you, Allison. Yeah. And all together, we call these things cultural wealth, right? When we look at them that way, when we choose to look at them. Talking circles, sweat lodge, ceremonies, yes. Dancing and singing, absolutely. And, there, and again, this is one of those areas, Joseph, that um, research is catching up with us. If you read My Grandmother's Hands or a book by a Dutch uh, researcher author called uh, The Body Knows the Score, um, they talk about that, move, how important movement is, dancing, joy, et cetera, to healing, right? cultural arts, gardening. Gardening and food choice, <laughs> yes. Yeah, if any of you spend a, a, a long amount of time in an institutional place like a school or a hospital, these are all anymore almost becoming a monopolized food system, right? Where you have a major supplier that's only bringing in certain amounts of food. Correct. Great. So, you know, this is, this is the goal or the focus of um, the national class standards in, in this um, trifecta of advancing health equity, uh, helping to eliminate health disparities and improving quality. And so the standards are organized in uh, 15, there's 15 standards that are organized within these themes, uh, which include governance, leadership, workforce development, communication and language assistance, and continuous quality improvement and accountability. So this is standard one, and standard one kind of sits by itself with, within this theme. Um, and then there's a split screen with the health side and the education side. So the class standards are slightly different within these two entities, within health and education. So on the health side, it says provide effective, equitable, understandable, and respectful quality care and services that are responsive to diverse cultural health beliefs and practices, preferred languages, health literacy, and other communication needs. And on the education side, ensure that students and parents receive from all staff members effective, understandable, and respectful mental health care that is provided in a manner compatible with their cultural health beliefs and practices and preferred language. Coming from the schools, I want to know where the school is because I'll go there tomorrow if it <laughs> exists. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but we have to create it. Um, so again, in the chat space, if you would um, like to share, or you can think about this on your own, but what are you currently doing within your organization to address any aspect of standard number one? And maybe we can put that back up, Saganya. Sure, I'll go back. Um, and we'll get this in the chat as a question. Thank you, Gabrielle. So what, what are you currently doing within your organization to address any aspect of these from either angle or both? Or are you? It's okay to say yeah. nothing. <laughs> okay. 
And if you don't know, that's okay too. Um, as Saganya said, we will share some resources, one of which is an assessment on the 15 standards where you can actually, uh, with a team or, or individually, assess your organization within these standards of where they're at. Thank you, Mary, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. There's so much that is already happening and that's really exciting. Uh -huh. Andrea. Salazar mentioned um, the Spanish language and a couple others have too. And what I found when I worked in a school, you know, it's, we also have to change our systems or our mechanisms, right? Just translating a letter and sending it in the mail um, still wasn't reaching our Spanish language community. So we had to also figure out different ways to connect to them other than the standard, you know, sending a letter home either in a kid's backpack or, or through the mail system. So we have a couple of minutes before we go into a break and I see a question here. Um, can you speak to building cultural resilience and capital as a means to promote, strengthen, increase culturally responsive recovery, holistic wellness and restoration? Yeah, I can, I can take a shot yeah. at that and then turn it over to you, Saganya, um, to, sure. to add to it. So, you know, building cultural um, skills within organizations uh, is, is of the utmost importance to me because otherwise it's, it's a, it's a one-way kind of action, right? Like we're going to provide materials or we're going to provide interpreters, um, but giving people skills starts to get in that, going back to that um, island or, or iceberg picture, it starts to help us deepen the interaction, right? Because it's, it's not just access, but it's also um, we miss out on some of the intimacy of relationship if we don't also teach the skills to folks, right? You think about your interaction with a mental health care provider, your interaction with a doctor. Um, and if you have access to that through language or through cultural understanding, you're able to create a more intimate experience for yourself, right? And I mean that in a, in a deep sense. Um, and then that could be missing if we're just providing tools for access. And so, Ganya, I don't know if you have more to add to that. Yeah, I, I, I love this question uh, in terms of building cultural resilience and capital as a means to promote strength and, and, uh, and increase recovery, uh, wellness and restoration. And I think that we are making that shift very slowly. But when you think back, to uh, uh, sort of immig immigration into this country and to uh, Native American communities where they were stripped of their culture uh, and, uh, or, and to immigrants who came into this new world and uh, chose to leave behind all of their culture because they wanted to be a part of this new society, this new American society. People gave up so much of their cultural strengths uh, the, 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 the cultural uh, practices and beliefs that sustained them and, and helped to create uh, wellness uh, and restoration for them. And I think that one of the things that we need to do is go back and think about that and to say, you know, are we asking questions in our organizations that promotes that? Are we asking questions about, tell me a little bit more about uh, what you would do in your culture to take care of yourself, you know, how would you, how would 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 this be treated within your own culture? Um, and and there are some amazing questions that uh, uh, I think Leninger, who did this work very very early, asked these questions. What does this mean to you when you are experiencing this um, sadness and this depression? Uh, what does that mean to you from your cultural perspective? So taking it back and putting it within the foundation of their culture is one way of recognizing culture, of, of uh, sort of respecting it and honoring it, 
and therefore integrating it into any work we do around recovery, wellness, and restoration. So um, there's so much more we can explore, but I realize that we're almost uh, at two o'clock. We're actually a minute past two. If we can all take a quick break, a stretch break, get yourself a glass of water, a bio break, uh, stretch yourselves, you know, give your eyes some rest and come back at uh, two or five, uh, five minutes past the hour. Thank you. So what we did is Kat and I uh, have sort of uh, taken these three themes and we're going to walk through each one of these three themes. Um, the very first one is the governance, leadership and workforce development. And so these themes are and I'm going to uh, so there are three standards under this. The, one is to advance and sustain organizational governance and leadership that promotes class and health equity through policy practices and allocated uh, resources. And for those of you who are within education, you might find the standard that we have adapted for education useful. So one is around, you know, really identifying, um, having governance and leadership focus on policy practices and allocated resource. Because without that, without the policy, uh, without the uh, processes that are put into place and without resources, none of this is going to happen. Uh, the third standard is to recruit, promote, and support a culturally and linguistically diverse governance, leadership, and workforce that are responsive for the population in the service area. There are so many times when we've worked with organizations that will say, oh, we, we really uh, uh, pay attention to diversity and we focus on diversity and we've been doing a real uh, drive to hire uh, diverse folks into our organization. And when you look at their data, their data might indicate that there's an increase in workforce uh, diversity. But if you look at their board or their advisory committee, or even their leadership structure, their C-suite structure and, and, and uh, administrative and leadership structure, you're not seeing any diversity there. And so this standard really says you've got to do it at all levels. And the, four, the, the fourth standard, which is a part of this, is to educate and train governance, leadership, and workforce in culturally and linguistically appropriate policies and practices on an ongoing basis. So the notion is that it's not only we train our workforce and, and we do that. We often will say, OK, we want to send all our staff to class standards and, 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 and have become knowledgeable. And that's great. Having your staff know it is, is really important. But if the board doesn't understand it, if leadership doesn't understand it, and if they don't uh, th then uh, consider, as we said before, changes in policies or infrastructures or identifying resources to make it work, then it's not going to happen. And so the education and training shouldn't be just for the workforce, it should be for all. And so when you really think about it, um, it, it is all those three things are really critical standards. And so we asked, uh, we created a poll and, and Gabrielle, if you could show them the poll, it is, we just want to know if you your organization is doing any one of these things and you know uh, feel free to uh, say yes to any and all that apply so i'm just noticing i think gabriel uh, folks don't see the results while it, they're coming in but we do as the host so um just sort of noting that board and advisory is at like 40 percent we have leadership higher policies, maybe not so high there. I see all leadership and governance members are engaged in these. That's a little bit low. Um, so at any point you want us to share the results and everyone can see them too. Um, yeah. so I think I think they're kind of... Yeah, I, 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 it's been good. are we ready to share? I, I think so. Uh, share, let's share the results Great. And so people can see, uh, uh, you know, where where more focus has been uh, paid to and, and you know, who's, who's doing more of what. Um, 
th that's great that you, you have many more uh, uh, organizations in which the leadership has communicated the importance of addressing equity. Um, you know, I, I think that people may articulate that uh, and then it takes time and effort to shift policies and practices. And oftentimes um, resources can be a, a real challenge. So it's, it's one thing for, for leadership to communicate the importance and then the follow through is where I think we need to be paying attention to, are they, are they uh, then following through with policies and resources? Um, recruitment of diverse personnel is strong, um, but where you see it is not so much in the leadership and the board and, and clearly, this, this is a pattern I see almost always, is staff get the training, um, but the leadership and the board members somehow assume that they don't need it because they are not direct providers. But if they don't understand it, it's going to be very difficult to, to make the kinds of transformational change, a, a transformation that is required. Um, is uh, providing cultural competence. Okay, yeah. Again, training is often done uh, for staff uh, and less so. Um, there was a question from Maria. Uh, can you please recommend ways to change an organizational culture which is traditionally not diverse or inclusive? And I think that one of the things is to really be able to um, communicate with the leadership and the governance, the value and importance of this. In our organization, when I was in, in Washington State Department of Health, uh, we had a director who had a clear vision of making this, these kinds of changes. And so she was uh, very supportive of it. But one of the things that she would say is that though she might support it, it, it became even stronger when staff who were at the provider le level would come up and, and bring up this notion of providing services that more that were more appropriate, that were more culturally culturally appropriate to integrate culture into the way we provided service, so that it was like both from the top and from coming from the the foundation, so to speak, of the providers that makes a difference. Um, the, you know, part of this is having the conversation uh, within your organization, bringing it up and talking about it. So Maria, you could be that catalyst. You could be that change agent to say, you know, this is something uh, we, we, the, the, the country is talking about. It, uh, this is something that is important. Um, and, and so uh, I, I think that that's a role that all of us can play. Um, I want to move to the next slide. And thank you for sharing the results, Gabrielle. Uh, I will talk about some of the things that we can do. Uh, these are some of the things that we can implement. First of all, we can ensure representation. Um, and every organization can begin to look at the way they hire, uh, the, how they recruit, and uh, uh, create that kind of diverse body within their organization because the more diverse the organization is, the more the organization is going to be asking those kinds of questions, um, provide opportunities for people to learn on an ongoing basis, whether they are staff or board members or advisory members. Um, you know, it's one of the things that we often hear is there aren't that many people uh, who are from diverse background in our communities. Part of the problem is that through the hiring and recruitment process, we sometimes stick to the same old. We, we put out announcements. I remember when I was working in, in two state uh, departments, they would put up through the mainstream newspapers and the mainstream organizations. And yes, that that's, has value. But if you really want to be uh, uh, including diverse uh, uh, sort of recruitment, what you need to be doing is going to ethnic communities and going to ethnic newspapers, ethnic associations, uh, you know, different ways uh, in which people communicate churches and pass out those kinds of information so that you are uh, sort of increasing the way in which people can uh, get this information about potential jobs. Um, what if, if a class is something that you're going to integrate within your organization, ensure that there is somebody or a, or a group that comes together and that is going to focus on it and they're going to serve as champions for it. 
we need to look at our mission, our vision, our values uh, of our organization. Are we integrating uh, the, the importance of culture and being culturally resonant uh, in our mission statements and our vision statements? Because if it's not there at that level, it's something that will get set aside. If it's there within the core uh, philosophy of the organization, then it gets uh, integrated into the org organizational work. Um, and, and sort of one of the things I think we were talking about is creating spaces for conversations. It is so critical. Um, this is the conversation of our times right now is how, how do we ensure, um, you know, uh, sort of equitable services? How do we ensure that we are uh, looking at um, practices that have not been racialized? You know, how do we change what we've been doing in the past uh, to serve our, our communities in a more meaningful way? And so these are some of the implementation activities that you can begin to integrate into uh, the uh, into team one, which is around uh, governance, leadership, and workforce development. I'm going to turn this over to um, Scott to talk about the second theme. Thank you, Saganya. And thank you everyone for the wonderful interactive questions and chat. Um, we're gonna look in at the English language um, proficiency, but also language assistance is what this theme is about. So LEP or language proficiency, any of you in schools know there's several different categories. It's based on testing students, um, proficiency in written, spoken, and, um, and literacy reading uh, with around English. For adults, this can also be uh, referred to as just English proficiency. And really a, a standard um, definition of English proficient means the ability for someone to communicate, someone who speaks a language, first language other than English, uh, to communicate meaning in spoken and written English, okay? So we'll hold on to that. And then language assistance is providing uh, reasonable access to the same services um, and then again, as we've been talking about, there's, this is the standard, but there's also this idea of moving beyond that, right? For full belonging or integration. And then next slide. So if you would share in the chat, um, what are five, the top five languages spoken in your clients' homes or within your context? Um, I wanna come back to something Linda Santi said. She spoke about 50 different languages in her rur rural district. Um, and so I do wanna, Thank you for that. Yes, it's not just urban areas that have multiple languages. It's, it's all over the place. And Linda, I don't want you to name all 50, but if you do, you're going to get some kind of prize, I think, at the end. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but please, in the chat, just list a few languages. Um, and, and as you're doing that, we'll look at the standard number five, which, again, in the health realm is offering language assistance to individuals who have limited English proficiency and our other communication needs at no cost to them uh, and to facilitate timely access to the care and service. And in the education realm, um, very similar to provide students and parents in their preferred language, both verbal offers, written notices, um, informing of them of their right to receive language assistance at no cost to them. Okay. Um, so this, this uh, is a video um, this particular person, her name's Holly Menati, I think is how you say her last name, but she's gotten pretty well known, in, especially in the social media world, for uh, translating ASL um, in like uh, rap concerts like Snoop Dogg and N Eminem and, and others. So this is a quick video. Okay, so if any of you have been to any kind of um, 
concert or event where there's a translator, uh, they don't have to go above and beyond, right? Like they can just provide the simple service. But she, as it was mentioned, studied 80 hours to, to because she wants to go above, she wants to provide an authentic experience in her language, right? For uh, the community that would be using that service. So um, that's what we talk about in the, in the belonging sense, right? Not just providing a service, but how are you truly integrating providing? Um, I do want to say really quickly too on, on language assistance in general, we have to also think about the other side of the coin. Like in our in the school I mentioned, I worked at the dual language school, we also provided training, customer service training for our front office staff because we were finding their patience and their ability to allow someone to try to speak English to them was waning at best. <laughs> So there's a two-way street. Like you also have to, if someone's going to take the, the um, opportunity or the risk to try to speak English to you, that are we also accepting of that? And do we have spaces where um, we have patience for that also? Um, communication, this is standard six, that we're informing the availability of language assistance in the preferred language and writing. There's some other tools that we can share with you in just a moment. We'll talk about that. Education, again, um, providing those, um, the declaration that it's there. Standard seven is the competence of the individual providing language assistance. So we're not just relying on uh, the siblings or the children to, to translate for the parents. There are some places where that's acceptable, but to our best effort, we really need to provide professional services, which is different than just basic translation, right? Professional translation. Um, that we have a duty of care to provide that. Okay. And then standard eight, um, it talks about print materials around. So, or we also call it signage, right? And you can do um, what we call an environmental scan of your organization, your business, your place of work. And you can just, just put on the lens of looking at signage. Is it accessible? Is it bilingual? Is it easy to understand for all communities? Um, including uh, individuals on the autism spectrum or um, individuals with disabilities, et cetera, right? Is it, uh, does it have icons? Is it colorful, et cetera, et cetera? There's all kinds of different um, hints you can have to make good signage and, uh, again, thinking about accessibility. And then these are some examples of how um, people in other, in Region 10, um, have been putting on trainings or webinars or other series, bringing in either their community or um, increasing their own knowledge and, and information around these issues, right? Around this topic that we're talking about. So um, that, and, and also look at the signage too, that it's representative of communities that would be served. Um, hopefully it's not, somebody mentioned in the chat space, I think T Brown, um, around tokenism, that we want to be very careful around that. We want to be representative. And so again, hopefully right now you're saying, well, how would we be representative? We'd want to include the community that we're representing and see what they think. Is this, you know, get, get input. And so it's that idea of with you, not just for you. We're not just using pictures of people to, uh, to generate interest, et cetera, but that there's actually a connection there. Right? Um, and so, yeah, so then. So uh, actually, uh, Gabriel, do we have a poll on this or do we want to just ask them these questions and have them uh, share their thoughts on chat? Ah. It's a great time to thank Gabrielle again. <laughs> and Christina, thank you so much for the support and the, uh, the tech support. Wonderful, thank you. It's all Gabrielle, it is amazing. So these yeah. questions, cause you can't see the results right now. So for number one, it's hovering around 60, yes, 15, no, some that don't know. And that's understandable. I imagine a lot of people might not know. Um, 
as far as the number two, do you ask around who needs language assistance? Quite, quite the majority, about three quarters, but you know, still some that say no. Um, and then some that don't know. And, uh, you know, if you're not doing intake, you might not see some of these, or maybe you just don't even realize they're, they're there. Um, and then third one, does your organization consider health literacy? Boy, that is a huge, (laughs) just general health literacy. I remember being in a training about that. And just, you talked about the iceberg, um, Mm -hmm. not being a reference, um, just boy, that's a whole nother area that is fascinating and so important, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. You know, at least over the majority are are asking about that, but not all. And and a lot of don't know. So if you Mm want to share the results, I think people are probably, there we go. Um, But yeah, and just want to note, I know we're at 2.30 and we have one question, I think still in the uh, Q&A and then just want to make sure we have enough time before we wrap up at three. So just you keep taking it away. Tell us what you need. And thanks, Gabriel and everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but- why don't we go to the implementation strategies, uh, Scott, yes. and then uh, we can try and respond to Irvin's uh, question around uh, culture wars. You got it. So again, these are just a few, and we encourage you to um, think about, collect, research other different implementation activities uh, to meet the needs of your of your communities. Um, so mechanisms in place to exchange information. And in this day and age, there's so many of those, including electronic resources, et cetera, that where you don't, it's, it's preferable to have a live person, but um, you don't have to in this day and age. Uh, staff training, look at that, staff, staff training and language assistance services. And it's just like I talked about also, not just the, um, the civil rights, which is very, very important, but also the customer service aspect, right? Um, identifying process to language individuals or to identify language an individual uh, and individual communicates. And that goes hand in hand with this one below, um, where it's these I speak cards that you can include uh, for clientele to uh, fill out ahead of time and then be able to hand somebody as a kind of a third thing, a way to communicate. Um, I need this assistance or this is, is what I have. And then simultaneously your staff also are there, ways in which they can display languages they speak on their name tag or others if they have it. Um, language assistance contracts for in-person interpreters, staff, et cetera. And again, um, there are services nationally in cities, uh, translation services, So, and, and many of them can do it, of course, remotely now. Uh, and this is so important, the qualified trained interpreters. We talked about how we often lean on family members which um, again, it becomes a right, right? Like we, if we really believe that everyone has the right to be communicated in a professional way that is understandable to them. And then the last couple of written materials are translated um, and then the health literally, literacy principles, um, signage, materials, avoid using medical terminology, um, and make things accessible and easy to including pictures, uh, colors, et cetera, which are also universal design kinds of ideas uh, for folks with in the disability community as well. Okay, You you can really accomplish a lot with just thinking about these things that would reach beyond just language, but to other communities as well. Thank you, Scott. So I'm going to just take a couple of minutes to respond to uh, Irvin, and then we'll go to team three, which is a combination of several things. And um, I think we should be okay. Uh, You asked such a good question. And uh, Christina and I can attest to the fact that we just had that conversation within our network uh, around building health equity and cultural responsiveness. And, and the reason being is we work now with, uh, in region nine, we work with four states and six uh, Pacific islands. And uh, in region 10, they work with, uh, you know, you all work with uh, four different uh, states. And we have states that are very, very different. There are states in which um, they have taken the critical race theory and have sort of have pulled it into the school system where it doesn't exist. And they are making that to be a huge issue. And therefore there are states that say, you can't talk about diversity, you can't talk about equity. 
Um, and there are even schools that say you can't talk about social emotional learning. And I would say that in the school system and the educational environment, it is much, much more rampant, this kind of pushback. And I think that it is also coming into the health arena. And so um, you're very right. It is very difficult in some places to even begin to have these conversations. And so one of the things that we are thinking about is how do we uh, support states and how do we support organizations that are continuing to try and do this work? My philosophy is we go back to the fundamental thing that we want to do. The fundamental outcome we want to achieve is we want to ensure that the people we serve get services that meet their needs in whatever form it takes. And that means we, get, we don't you have to use the word equity, we don't have to use the word diversity, we don't have to talk about race, but we say we want to provide services that are appropriate for this particular client and look at it as a person-centered uh, and an individual-centered care, which is what it's all about anyway, cultural competence and equity. And if we use that uh, terminology and if we talk about that, then uh, we are going to be able to continue to do the work without actually using some of these terms right now. There is a pushback with a group of people who said, no, we have to force these issues. And yes, they can. Um, but it also, I also know people who work with state uh, entities and the state, they can't do that. They're gonna lose their jobs. So I think we have to be really thoughtful about this and really stay true to what it is that we want to achieve. I hope Irvin that has been helpful. Um, but we are struggling with this and trying to find out how we can support our, our con constituents in our regions around this work. So the last one I want to go to is the, uh, the stand, the theme three, which really encompasses three different things. It's accountability, it is uh, quality uh, improvement, and it is community engagement. And there are uh, all together, I think eight different uh, standards. And so I'll go through them. And what, the first one is uh, having culturally and linguistically appropriate goals, policies and management accountability and infuse them throughout the organization's planning and operations. That means that if you are going to do, if you're going to identify three languages in which you need to provide services, then identify the number of clients who are being served how they're being served and, and, and maintain the records because those records can be very, very helpful for you uh, in thinking about uh, what accountability means. And so, um, and you know, it, it's uh, really ensuring that we have the right policies, that we have right goals in mind and that we do the work and we are measuring it at the end of it to ensure that they are being integrated. Um, Standard 10 is ongoing assessments. We won't know what we've been able to do and what we've been able to achieve if we don't know where we came from. And so one of the things that we encourage people to do is do assessments of, of the things that, uh, that they think are important and then to start doing some of this work and then identifying a year down the road uh, what they've been able to achieve. Uh, my cha the, the, the challenge sometimes is that the minute you say assessment, people kind of push back a little bit because assessment can indicate that people are not doing something really well. And I, and, and I know that that fear of not wanting to, uh, not uh, being sort of uh, measured and being, and being told that you're not doing it so well is really problematic, which is why the term cultural competence has always been problematic. Um, However, if we can tell people that we just want to know progress over time, it's not that we did good or we did bad, but we just want to know that a year from now, if we put time and attention to it, we are achieving our results. So it, it's communicating assessment and why it's important is, is as important as doing the assessment. Data. Data can be a real problem because in the past, we really haven't paid much attention to it. You know, that is the real data, race, ethnicity, language. Um, more and more states are beginning to collect that data. Now, and actually I was working in Maryland and I was told 
uh, that is within the school system until about five years ago, the only data they were collecting around race and ethnicity is white, black, and other. And, and so, so I think that we really need to go back and look at our demographics and look at the data and look at what exactly it is that we are measuring and why we need to measure what we, we are measuring, not just for the purpose of wanting to do it. And, um, and also explaining to people, both the people from whom we collect the data and the people who are asking the data, sharing with them the value of getting this good information because it can enhance services uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, standard 12 is uh, community health assessments. And we have some incredible tools now around that. Uh, we used to only look at it as needs assessment, but I am so grateful for the work uh, that has been done in Canada where they have really looked at it as community com communities come with both strengths and needs and that any true assessment is, is exploring all those cultural strengths that they have and resources that they have in the community and what they might need because that will go to inform what kinds of services we can provide. Um, 13 is around uh, always, always working with the, with the community. And I think, um, as Scott said it uh, earlier, it is not for you, but it is with you. And I love what the, um, the Youth Forum uh, says. They say, nothing about us without us. And uh, Youth Move National International does that. And I think that that is such an incredible way of thinking about it. Don't, we don't go into communities and tell them what we are going to do. We go into communities and we talk about what can we do together to, to strengthen the health services. And so it's this partnering uh, around policies and practices and services that are critical. The uh, standard uh, 14 is ensuring that we have a way in which uh, both our staff and our community members who receive services from us can communicate to us when things have not gone so well. Um, we are really uh, sort of uh, haven't paid as much attention to it, uh, both from staff perspectives and from uh, our communities when it comes to being pr providing culturally appropriate services. So that, that is one of, uh, it's a simple way in which to ask uh, communities that question and gather that data. And the last one is uh, we really, uh, if we do this work, we need to communicate why we do this work, its value, and um, how we're going to uh, continue to sustain this work, uh, both implementing and sustaining these uh, standards. And one of the things uh, is that we need to be open in our communication. We need to share this information. Sometimes it will be difficult information to share because we may still have disparities in our community that we've not been able to redress. But the fact that we are working on it and that we are uh, wanting them to partner with us in uh, ensuring that we can be successful uh, goes a long way to make our communities uh, feel like they're being heard. And so these are the 15 uh, standards in total. And the, the thing is, it seems like a lot, but I always tell people is start with something that you can put into practice right away, a simple thing, uh, something that is easily achievable for your organization, and then work from there to doing more of the complex uh, uh, standards. So we have, I think, another poll and we're gonna be asking the same questions in the poll, I think. Am I right, Gabrielle? Yeah, there we go. So there are three different questions, and if you could respond to it, that would be great. Just give everyone a couple of minutes. I'm and really... Fact... Oh, oh go sorry, ahead. Go, on you. go ahead, Christina. No, 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 I, I was, it's gonna be a little bit of a detour, so please finish up with the results and see see what you're, yeah. you're making yeah. of those. No, I, I, I am... Uh, you know, the fact that so many of you uh, uh, have actually uh, have organizations in which uh, patients and families and the larger community is engaged with you is really, really a positive sign. 
that really makes me feel ex excited about the work that you're doing in your states uh, in Region 10. Um, then the, the fact that you're also regularly look, assessing the needs of your uh, clients uh, as it relates to language needs and uh, you're monitor monitoring it regularly is also you're very strong in that. So um, it, it, that's really, really uh, great. Um, and then does the board and senior leadership have a process of accountability? This is where I think I'm not surprised that it's a little lower. Um, I think it has been always challenging about how do we, how do we uh, you know, make some of these things uh, accountable. And I think that we are used to doing a lot of quantitative uh, measurements and qualitative measurements are a little harder for us to, uh, to measure. Uh, and one of the things we need to do is think about uh, what are different ways in which we can look at accountability. I, you know, I think we are, we are such a Western-based society in which we look at data as numbers and questionnaires and all of that. And I was just talking to uh, a, a, a Native American friend, and we were just exploring some leadership work we're doing together. And she said, you know, I'm so tired as, of us asking questions. Why don't we just ask people to tell us their stories? And we collect that information and convert that into data that, is, that, can, that we can use because people will tell stories more easily. And I think that that is very, very uh, true. And I also think that we now have the technology to be able to translate some of that stories into meaningful data. And so it's, it's important for us to keep looking at this and thinking about this in different ways to meet the cultural lived experiences of, of uh, different cultures. So I would like to go to um, some implementations, uh, activities that we can do. Um, you know, one of the things is, like I said, doing assets and needs assessments in partnership with community uh, members is really important. Um, advisory members from your community. And then to share that data uh, uh, through, you know, uh, graphics and, and, and sharing through uh, information and sharing what, what are the determinants that informs the health within that community is really uh, critical. Um, planning and conducting organizational assessments. Um, I know that they are assessment surveys are almost always very, very time consuming. So I would say that you don't have to take all of the class standards and try to do a, a survey with them. I would say if you think that team one or team two or team three is or within team three, if it's accountability or community engagement is an area where you want to begin first then do a short survey, a, a quick survey that will help you gather information about that particular theme and then to begin to doing it. Uh, I think sometimes what we think is we have to do this whole thing uh, in a holistic way. And that's not how it's, uh, it, we can uh, sometimes manage this because we're already doing a lot of different things. And what we wanna be able to do is integrate it into something we're already doing. And therefore taking it in chunks and doing it, it can be more helpful. Um, so like I said, that's why a specific focus of some of the class related activities in assessment and planning. Um, looking at demographic data, again, Look at your data. Are you co collecting uh, real data? Are you collecting race, ethnicity, language, uh, you know, other kinds of specific that can be helpful to the class standard? Um, you know, looking at families and youth and, and, and clients that you are serving and seeing if, they, if you can integrate them into helping to plan and, and Collecting data from them in terms of what they think about your services can be very helpful. Um, again, we talked about cultural resources. It is hard for us to sometimes capture that information. I think it might be, uh, this might be uh, a, a place where you can turn to your community partners and stakeholders and help ask them to help you gather this data. Uh, so that you can then identify the, the different resources within the community. And, and the, the last one, as I said, is there has to be a way in which they can communicate with you when things are not working out. 
whether it's not working out for the clients or whether it's not working out for the staff. It has to be confidential. It has to be, they have to feel like there are going to be no consequences to it. And so identifying a way that is uh, that can be done, that can protect them uh, is, is, a, is important for us to think about. So these are some implementation strategies. Um, and one of the things that we want to do is to, uh, to be able to share these strategies with you across all these themes so that you can look at some of these and say, you know, I can do X, Y, and Z. In my organization, I can put that into practice in the next month and we can look at it for six months and see what a difference it makes. And, and so then you're building into it an ongoing assessment that is gonna help you. Uh, again, like I said, don't think of this as a whole. Think of this as pieces that you can take and uh, and put to, to pra into practice. And then, uh, you know, once you've achieved that, then to think about other change ideas and and what what else you can do. Um, Suganya, so um, yes. actually, so I'm going to have Gabriel do one last poll that is a little bit of a surprise poll. So I apologize for that. But but what you're talking about is um, really in line with our planning for year five. And so uh -huh. this is um, a topic that we had been long wanting to present and know that we're running out of time because it is enormous. Um, mm -hmm. And there are aspects that I imagine all of you um, may have control over and you, others you might not. And so there's so many pieces to this. Um, and so I wanted to run this poll um, really just do you want to hear more about the class standards? And I guess, you know, if you want to put into the chat um, some of the kinds of things we can do now, it depends on, you know, um, some of our events do need to be um, really region 10 specific because of the way our funding works. This is not one of them. It's totally fine. Everyone's here from wherever. Um, but, you know, if you are in region 10, especially, um, are there things that stuck out for you today that we can try to think about for activities for year five, um, diving deeper, doing something like a learning community, a series where you're actually interacting. Um, you know, I don't have any uh, magic wand to make this happen just yet, but we're just in the beginning stages of really thinking about, you know, if this is a topic that, you know, everyone is so interested in and really want to try to further in your work. So it seems like resounding. Yes. Most people are interested in learning about this, but if you want to put into the chat, um, you can also reach out to us via our email. Um, but you know, if there, if there's something that you could imagine doing um, that, you know, that would be great to know uh, what, what you might like to hear more about. Um, we do have this uh, evaluation. So I wanted to not go go there uh, yet, Saganya and Scott, but are there other, if you have some last slides, I just wanted to yeah. chime in with that because I thought it was so Well, relevant. actually uh, the last slide is, uh, okay. what is one action you will take as a result of this uh, workshop? We kind of like to do this so that we can, you know, uh, if, if within the, the this next week, you can do something that relates to this workshop, then it, it's a meaningful uh, engagement that you've had today. And so we would love to know what that might be. And as we as you're doing that, let me share a little bit about the question that uh, Christina asked, what more can we do around this topic? What well, one of the, I can give you an example of uh, what uh, one, uh, organization did. And this was the, uh, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. They had asked us to do a class presentation and we did a class presentation for them. And what they really wanted to do is they wanted to adapt the class standards, both for school mental health, which is why we created the school uh, related uh, you know, uh, standards. Uh, it's not something that came from the Office of Minority Health. We just said, okay, how would this look in a school environment? And secondly, they said, we want it specific for our CNMI culture, uh, for the cultures that are in, within CNMI. And so the, what we did is we create, we, we're creating a chart that really looks at uh, the standards. It looks at the kinds of rules and regulations that exist that can support the standards. And then they also wanted to know how they can measure those standards so that they can figure out on an ongoing basis, you know, how successfully they're integrating class into their 
uh, school mental health. So that's one way in which they are moving forward in this work. And so, you know, as you think about if you want more class information, what kind of information you want might be helpful to Christina so that in our planning for year five, we're all trying to do year five planning. That would be very helpful. Yeah. Well, and I just want to let you know, so when um, we do, you know, uh, put the recordings up of, of these sessions and we do put a lot of resources. So I know Saganya and Scott, you have shared, you know, a few things um, with us. And then I was, you know, looking through our catalog um, of a number of things, including things that the Region 9 MHTTC has done. Um, so you'll have even more resources at your fingertips when we get that product page um done in the next week or two. Um, so yeah, there's another one Scott's done. So that's fantastic. Um, just want to say if, uh, folks can, um, so in this new evaluation, just remember the personal code is wonky and please just do what you're comfortable with, um, in filling that out. We mostly, um, well, we only really want your feedback, not so much how the code is um, a little wonky, but we'd love to get your feedback. Um, I want to go ahead and just um, thank Saganya and Scott. Um, just so, so grateful for your time today. Obviously, it's been very impactful from all the comments and interactions. Um, really, you know, this, you kind of did this out of the kindness of your heart, I think, Saganya and Scott, um, because we've been talking with you about, you know, we really wanted to bring this topic to our region and our, our, our folks that come to our training. So thank you so much. Um, I need to run through just a couple of things at the end, but do you want to yeah, say I, any parting words? There, there was one comment and Linda asked that comment. She said, you know, class issues oh, become yeah. very depending on on the dominant culture and that you are so absolutely right, uh, Linda. It is, the, the, the dominant culture is the one that actually creates the structure and the policies uh, for the organization. And if they are of a different culture than the clients they serve, then they go, they're going to have to do the work of uh, ensuring that their services are culturally and linguistically appropriate. So absolutely, um, that that is the case. And since you're talking about uh, a native, uh, a, a tribal organization, I'm sure that th those are the kinds of issues you're looking for. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, uh, Christina. Oh no, Scott. Do you want to say any um, parting words before I go well, to our? Thank you so much. I, I really what a, even though it was kind of a one way conversation here. Um, very rich interaction in the chat and then the questions and the polling. So thank you for your participation. And uh, we're, we're hopeful at some point, maybe we could do a little more interactive uh, work where we really, there's such a richness in all of your experiences. It would be wonderful to, uh, to mine that in some way. So thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Well, thank you both. And thank you, everybody. Um, please do the evaluation if you can. It's really helpful for us. Um, wanted to share, we do have um, a two-part equity series that you might be interested in. Um, Dr. Ashley Stewart, uh, who works with C4 Innovations, is going to be uh, coming back. Um, and so anyone's welcome to uh, attend that. Um, we'll put links in the chats for how you can attend. We also have um, a very special uh, set of webinars for um, LGBTQ suicide prevention and awareness for families coming up. So we'll get those um, in the chat. Uh, we also, when we say farewell, we'll leave the room open for a few minutes so you can grab these things. But you also, if you're, if you're wanting to hear about these things, you can go to our website, you can sign up for our announcements. Um, so this is how you would do that. I think the QR code gets you to either to our website or our maybe the newsletter sign up. I'm not sure. I haven't tried it lately, but um, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we just, again, thank you, Saganya and Scott. This has been very, very wonderful. I remember when we were talking, should it be 90 minutes or two hours? Like, can it be 12 hours? Because I think we need a lot more. Um, so thank you so much for everybody uh, being here today. And we'll leave uh, this open for a bit. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone. Thank you so much for your time and being with us today. All right. Thank you.